welcome to Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted to be joined by Lawrence Conley and Natasha Meikle for another Axon Bulletin. Managerial mer- merry-go-round has begun in Scottish football already. We know that Neil Lennon has gone. Motherwell have changed their manager. Uh, Kilmarnock have changed their manager. Now Aberdeen um, have parted ways with Derek McInnes. What do you think will happen in terms of the shuffle effect? You know, will John Kennedy end up being offered a job elsewhere, do you think, Natasha? I think it's possible. Um, I think one thing that we have seen is that once a manager moves, it creates this knock-on effect. And I do think Aberdeen could do worse than to consider someone like John Kennedy. And I think it could be interesting from a Celtic perspective as well. Um, if he goes away somewhere learns his trade a bit more, gets a bit more experience in the managerial seat, then I don't see there being an issue for the, the doors to open to him further down the line. You know, I was thinking last night, I mentioned that, um, you know, in relation to you've got somebody like Jack Ross at Hibs. Uh, I do expect there to be a wee shuffle within the Scottish game. Uh, Robinson, who has left, Stephen Robinson, of course, who left Motherwell, I think, very highly rated coach. And, you know, these types of guys, Jimmy Goodwin, you would maybe expect Goodwin to make another step up. Very similar, I think, in terms of his career path to Jack Ross, going from Alawa to St Mirren. Jack Ross maybe went far too uh, soon down south before coming back to Hibs. Um, and then I asked the question, you know, would Jack Ross leave Hibs for Aberdeen? Are they on the same kind of level? And you were saying to me today that um, one of the favourites for the Aberdeen job is in actual fact Enzo Maresca. I was looking at Sky Sports um, earlier on their, their app and they've actually made Maresca the second favourite for the Aberdeen role. Um, so he's Three to one um, on the Aberdeen odds and two to one in the Celtic odds, and it does make you wonder. And you know, obviously, there is an element of that being bookies, you know, making things up. They do sort of throw some names in the hat to get some traction, but at the same time, it's given me a bit of concern that if Celtic are, you know, essentially shopping in the same aisle as Aberdeen for the next manager, as a Celtic fan, that's not really where I expect the club to be. Um, With all due respect to Aberdeen, I think we're operating in a different market. I think that the person who comes in for the Celtic role shouldn't be a person who would also consider taking on the Aberdeen role. Um, we must be operating in different markets. And that's, again, like I said, no disrespect to Aberdeen, but Celtic as a club must have higher ambition with the finances that we have available to us. And it does concern me that we're looking in the same market as Aberdeen. But again, could be a bit of booky talk um, because Maresca is definitely on his record and on everything I've read about him as someone that would excite me for the Celtic job. So surely he is without the reach of Aberdeen. Well, you know, the thing with uh, Enzo Maresco, we, we did speak about him a couple of weeks back. We were talking about the whole situation with the director of football and uh, Fergal Harkin. Every time I say that, I think of Fergal Sharkey. But um, there was this discussion around whether or not that would interest the Celtic supporters, particularly coming up to the season tickets. And I think that uh, when I, st- I discussed that with JP, JP Mason, he was, uh, by the end of it, uh, pretty happy with that situation because it was more of a, a medium to long term rather than just get somebody in, get the season tickets sold and almost like a knee jerk reaction to what's happened this season. But uh, I share your concerns in in a sense with, with uh, the fact that we are shopping in the same aisle as Aberdeen when it comes to a manager. Um, again, though, it may well just be uh, all to do with odds and uh, bookies, etc. I was reading actually this morning about Enzo Maresca. He was leading the um, under-23s potentially to Man City's first ever Premier League 2 title so obviously he's 100% focused on that at the minute Natasha but it's an idea that I think has been touted over the last few days by so called credible sources on social media uh, people in the Italian and Spanish press have been looking at Enzo Maresca as a, as a potential Celtic manager um, having looked at the second game under John Kennedy this is something that, you know, we would prefer to do now because, I mean, we are in a very difficult situation. Uh, we've, che- we've, we've obviously made the changes that we wanted in terms of the CEO and the manager, but you've got Enzo Maresco, if he's the man 
chasing a Premier League two title um, and you think to yourself well surely the Celtic manager's job no disrespect to anybody down south but surely the Celtic manager's job is a bigger draw than that and if you want to come you've got to get them in now you've got to start assessing the squad you've got to decide are there any loan players Natasha that we want to bring back I know a couple of them have have impressed um, we're, we're linked to numerous players we've already brought in Liam Shaw does that whole uh, the mechanics of transfers just continue regardless of whether or not we even have a manager in place I mean, like you've touched on, timing is going to be absolutely key here. Um, we're now around 100 days away from the first Champions League qualifier. And in the past, we've been particularly guilty of going into them seriously un- underprepared. And my worry is, is that if we delay any appointment of manager, we're going to see the exact same pattern again. And we're going to be very underprepared, not only for the Champions League faults, qualifiers, but for the start of you know the next season's premiership. Um, so that's a concern and for that reason I think we need to to make this move as soon as possible I understand why someone like Maresca wouldn't come now but Celtic have to make it that attractive enough opportunity to to say look this is the job that's on the table but we need you to come within the next month Um, the sooner we get him in like you said the sooner he can assess the squad decide what we need and be ready for that transfer window opening you know we don't want someone coming in after the window's already open um, and then looking at the squad deciding what we need and all of a sudden you know the season's weeks away from starting and you're trying to blend the squad together that's only you know maybe been in place for a few weeks we need to be ready for next season um, so timing is so so important and Coupling that with the fact that the club have season tickets to sell. Mm. You know, we're into March. Those renewal letters are going to be coming out relatively soon. And if the fans don't hear anything, and if there's no communication on from the club in terms of who the next appointment is going to be, the direction that we're going in, you know, fans may be more reluctant to, you know, part with their money for another perhaps virtual season ticket. So the club need to to keep that in mind and surely must be thinking about making this announcement sooner rather than later. You would think so. Now, there were some sound uh, audio issues, which thankfully everybody uh, raised early doors in the broadcast. I'm going to see if we can bring Lawrence back in because uh, there's certain subjects uh, on today's bulletin that I'm sure Lawrence has an opinion on. Let's give it a try. Lawrence, give us a one, two, three. Is everything coming across loud and clear? Hail, hail, mate. I can hear you. Uh, Can you hear me okay? There is a a terrible buzz. I don't know what is happening at your end, unfortunately. So um, we'll try again, Lawrence. We will try again. There's a terrible buzz when you talk. Um, But I don't want to go through this bulletin and not ask you uh, about certain factors in relation to the doubt over the Glasgow Derby game actually going ahead due to certain uh, behaviours that we've we've had to witness over the last few days. But still on the subject of the manager... um, Quite a lot of good points coming through. Zinko, Maresca to Aberdeen, surely not. And Ian Walker comes in, is that the ex-Spurs goalkeeper? Aberdeen suffering from delusions of grandeur. Well, another name that was uh, in the mix this morning was Jürgen Klinsmann for Aberdeen. So, I mean, you know, it's it's just rumours at this stage. Um, I was saying to yourself, Natasha, some of the chat yesterday was around a, a shuffle amongst uh, the Scottish managerial pack. Would that uh, result in maybe Jimmy Goodwin moving from St Mirren uh, to Aberdeen? Would St Mirren be a good place for the likes of John Kennedy to go? It sounds as though we just want John Kennedy to get a job somewhere else, and that's maybe a bit cruel. Um, last week, of course... I was in that uh, media conference with John Kennedy and David Turnbull and I did say I was impressed with uh, the cut of his jib which doesn't mean to say that I want him as a manager of Celtic and then we watched the Dundee United game at the weekend and it was the same old, same old. Now I'm going to test Lawrence's sound here in relation to the managerial situation. Lawrence, what is your current thoughts on potential Celtic targets and if you start buzzing you might disappear again mate. Okay, uh, I'd rather we took our time and got the right guy in. Uh, I know we've been, there's kind of perhaps the rush to get somebody in prepared for the Champions League, but I'd be worried about making a mistake and, and try to force something through and ended up with the wrong guy and putting ourselves further behind. I'd rather think this is quite a key appointment. I think Don Mackay looks good so far. If he's had any influence in getting you in the press conference, it could be a, a good start. You know, you and other podcasters getting there. Uh, 
and hopefully we take our time and appoint the right manager, whether that's Maresca, Benitez, or whoever, who knows. I think one of the biggest concerns for me is we're hearing about all these players that were interested in. Natasha Liam Shaw obviously has already come in from Sheffield Wednesday on a pre-contract. He's not come in, obviously. He will be coming in. But I've seen names such as uh, Kyle Joseph. He's been linked. He's a Wigan Athletic striker. Uh, also 19 years of age. We're in a market where we're bringing players in uh, on freedom of contract or 300 grand, which would be the case with Joseph. Um, again, in the past, these would have been looked upon as project signings I don't think we're really you know in the market or in a position to be signing project signings we're going to have to bring in players surely who can hit the ground running we're already looking at the squad assessing the squad looking at the types of players we might already have out on loan that we might be able to bring back in to play a part in next season and then you know complement and supplement them with, with some other signings um, how difficult is it to understand the situation with Celtic at the moment because obviously the, the, the mechanics of that is still ongoing do we already have someone in place who we are liaising with and engaging with to say are you happy with that signing it all seems a bit of a grey area at this moment in time that's the concern um, and you hope that there's a bit more clarity on that behind the scenes but certainly if I was a player at the moment um, whose agent was coming to them with a potential offer from Celtic I would be reluctant to go to a club where I don't know who the manager's going to be by the time I get there um, You know, so who is the one scouting these players right now, who is giving it the go ahead um, if it's the current team in place you know, absolutely they might fancy a player and think that he's the man for the job and however many weeks, months, time, the next manager would come in and they might not be in favour at all. So if I was plotting my next career move, it wouldn't be to a club whose manager would change by the time I've got there. Um, so I think that's going to hinder who we're able to attract, which is another reason for bringing the next manager or management team in as soon as we can, because this is going to be a very important transfer window. We need to make sure we get it right, but we need to sure we've got the, be sure we've got the right manager who's choosing the right players. And right now we have we don't have the manager, so we can't have that insight into what he wants his squad to look like. So time is key. We need to get we need to get on with this sooner rather than later. See, this is a big thing, again, with regards to signings. I think over the years, when you look at the amount of players that have come in, there have been so many that you know, right, they're not first-team ready. They might have to... Um you know, 18 months of development football before we introduce them. There are others who should have came in a lot sooner than that, such as um, Ismail Asoro and um, David Turnbull, of course. But I don't think we're in that position. We don't have that luxury anymore. You're looking at the turnover of players. We spoke about it over the weekend. Four loanees going back to their parent clubs, players out of contract. The big three, as I call them, and Christy um, and Eduard and Ayer, who may all leave the club and then on top of that you've got Encham who's no longer wanted at Marseille by the looks of it he'll be coming back and we'll be trying to set him up with a new club will Scott Brown remain at Celtic will we manage to get a player out of uh, either a Yeti or Barkas so we could be looking at a turnover of staff which is huge and, and thrown into that mix as well the likes of Rogic and Beaton who you know will probably be leaving the club also a massive turn and I just don't think we can afford to be bringing in um the type of player like, you know, in the past, Luca Connell, bring him in, 300 grand, he might play, he might not. I think every signing has to be key. Every signing has to be key to the master plan of the new gaffer coming in. Lawrence, is that a concern for you? I know that um, the question was coming in, why would we possibly consider an under-23 gaffer from Man City's academy? Um, it came in from Kaplan Mark, but the, the comments are coming in thick and fast and it's, it's left the screen. I think the whole thinking behind it is to have the the setup that is already in place at Man City. So you would have Fergal Harkin, who's a director of football and who has been impressed, obviously, with the development aspect of someone like Enzo Maresca. It may not be about the purchasing of players. I think a lot of that will be done at the director of football level. But then once the players are with Maresca, it's all about developing them, increasing their value, getting them from that kind of 23 level into the first team. So it's something that we pitched a couple of weeks ago and I can understand people being sceptical of it particularly after the events of the last couple of weeks but I think also a club like Celtic at this moment in time need to actually look further ahead than just next season Lawrence what's your thoughts on that situation as we as we sit here today? 
if, if that's the team, you know, we're bringing in a team that looks like it works. Uh, there's been a lot of chat about players regressing, so we definitely need somebody that can improve them. And uh, I think Steen only signed Willie Wallace out the Lisbon Lions. Brendan Rogers, what was it, Toure and Sinclair, he added to the players that were already there. Those were managers that improved players and got better performances out of them. And, and look at the success they had to do in that. And if Maresca has that ability, you know, why not bring him in? I think what the question is, is under 23 level, where you could really judge if he's got the ability or not. Because we're not talking about getting players ready for 23 level, it's first team in Europe. Absolutely. Uh, you know, and it, that's the question mark. But there's going to be a question mark over any manager that comes in. But if they brought in a team that knows each other and already works and have got an established working relationship, that's for me, it's a pretty smart move. You're getting people that can work together. You don't get that uh, discord that has been there between, or fallout, you know, that doesn't, the gears grind in between the manager and the, the CEO or the manager and the guy in charge and it's doing the recruitment. You need that to work uh, in, in sync. That that will lead us on to one of the the headlines today uh, around John Collins, which was a surprise at that. I know that um, John Collins is a very confident individual. I remember thinking back maybe a, a month or two ago where he gave an interview where he said he wouldn't manage again in Scottish football because of the culture. But he did go on to say that he might consider a role as a director of football he did say that back then so uh, yesterday in a totally unrelated interview I was speaking to Gary Locke and we spoke to Gary Locke about the John Collins um, idea, the concept around Collins being a a director of football and Gary Locke spoke very highly of him he says he's all about um, conditioning, he is you know, the epitome of this 24-7 athlete, um, whether or not that can be translated to a dressing room um, is another question. I mean, I know that he struggled when it came down to it at Hibs, even though he won them a trophy. And it looks as though, as part of the Ronnie Dyla team, there was, there was struggles really there as well, Natasha, when we think back to senior pros having an issue with maybe the approach and the philosophy that he was part of. Um, you know, that there's the actual dialer and Collins era, I feel, is kind of similar in nature to the the potential move down the kind of left field of Enzo Maresca. Not the big name, very much like Ronnie Dyla, not the big name. It wasn't all about profile. It was more about, let's bring someone in who can develop players. And I th- I've said before, I think the biggest error we made back then was making Dyla the manager. I thought we should have made John Collins a manager because I think he could have pulled that off. I think it would have suited him. Yes, he has an ego and it would have been right up his street and just let Ronnie Dyla get on with developing players and trying to implement this philosophy. Whether or not it would have worked any better, who knows? I mean, but, you know, history will tell us we still won two leagues in a row and we, you know, were a whisker away from winning a treble. If you would call it a whisker, I know Lawrence would call it something else. Um, So when we're looking at that whole situation... Uh, with regards to John Collins, and and let's be let's be fair here, he's thrown his own hat into the ring, Natasha. It's not as though there's any um, kind of weight to that story. It's not as though Celtic are in discussions with him. Um, do you think it would be warmly received? I'm not sure. Um, you know, like you said, it is John Collins who has thrown his own name in the hat for this. So there's no, you know, question as to whether he's perhaps not even on the club's radar. I mean. I think that I'm probably the right person for the role of CEO at Celtic. But that doesn't mean I'm on their radar or that they should consider me for the job. Um, I think I've got that skill set. Probably don't. Um, But I think I would do a good job there. Similarly, I don't think John Collins is the right man for this role. Um, Only because I don't think he is what we need at this stage. Like you said before, I think he was probably good at what he did under and with Dyla and I think that was a mismatch of management style and players. I think we've actually seen the opposite happen this time around. I think Dyla and um, Collins would actually have gotten better with this squad of players than they did with the squad of players they had available to them and similarly you know perhaps Lennon and Kennedy Strachan are more suited to a type of squad that Dyla and Collins had. So of course, it's all, you know, in hindsight, but we'll never know. But if we'd swapped those two management teams and squad rounds, I think you could have got a different response. Um, and football is modernising. It is moving more towards the way of thinking of, you know, the fitness, the sports science, the statistics. And, you know, I think that that is what Colin sees as his skill set and that what he can 
bring to the role of director of football. Now, the players at the time, you know, the senior pros in his squad when he was with Thaila didn't entertain that at all. You know, they weren't interested. If you look at, you know, we're taking the senior players as being Commons and Stokes, Hooper, Mulgrew, Ledley. They were suited to a type of manager like Lennon. You know, you've mm-hmm. got all of those ex-pros come out and compliment Lennon and what he did in his man management. And like I say, I'm sure that was absolutely suited to them. But what the squad of players we have now, you know, the Enchams, the Edwards, the Gillians, the Ayers, perhaps they could have and would have benefited from somebody a bit more like John Collins or a bit more like Ronnie Dyla. And maybe that is the direction we need to look in. Um, All I would say is that if we did consider someone like John Collins for a director of football role, which isn't really for me, um, you'd have to make a good managerial appointment to go with it in order to, you know, keep the fans on side in that one. And he would need to ditch the Timberland jacket as well. But I think when we look back to the fact that he has been a director of football um, before, hasn't he? He worked with Livingston alongside John Hughes in that role. And I don't think it was something that was um, particularly successful back then. This is, you know, this is one of the most important uh, managerial appointments and every managerial appointment at Celtic is important. But because of the nature of where we are as a club and everything, all the other outside influences around about outside of football, this is the most pivotal appointment. I mean, the pressure is actually on the decision makers at Celtic Park. And I've said before, whatever decision they make will basically tell us what their ambition is. You know, are they going to make a, an appointment where it's like, you know, let's just see out the next three seasons, stabilise everything financially, and then we can maybe go again? Or are we going to have that long-term view? And I think that, you know, the man that Lawrence Conley uh, named earlier and Dominic Mackay um, doesn't seem to be coming in on a short-term uh, basis. That's not going to be the vision. So I would be hugely surprised if we did bring in someone like John Collins. Um, I'm, I'm warming to the idea of having a partnership that's already um, proved to be working, Lawrence, because we've moaned and we've criticised the club all season for chucking a, a group of guys together and, and, you know, in terms of Neil Lennon, John Kennedy and Gavin Strachan. You know, we've done something similar with Ronnie Dyla, putting him together with John Collins and just hoping that it works. Um, did it work? Well, it did because we won the league. I mean, there's no question it worked. It could have worked better. And what you're actually saying, Natasha, I think some of the, particularly the players that were brought in by Brennan Rodgers, would have worked better under the system that Dyla and, and Collins were trying to implement. When you look at the way that perhaps players have come through the Man City Academy, like in Chan, like Frimpong, um, or the PSG Academy, like uh, Eduard, they're going to respond to that philosophy, you know, that belief that uh, every waking moment is around preparing your body and your, your, your mental strength for the game at the weekend. So I, I totally agree with you. I just think it was kind of out of time. But we're now back at that situation. Lawrence, you said before that, um, you know, whoever, whoever's going to be announced, it's, it's not going to um, you know, be universally acclaimed. I think there are a few uh, names that have been in the picture that, that certainly would be. I mean, I think it would be very much a minority that wouldn't like someone like Martinez in the role, or even Eddie Howe. You know, being being named because I can't remember, and I've got to say this, and correct me if, if your experience was different. I can't remember anybody being unhappy when Rogers was named as a manager of Celtic way back when. Um, is there anybody on the list that you've seen that would be universally uh, accepted? Do you think, Lawrence? Universally accepted, I think. You know, there's a few like Benitez. How they've touched on the big names, but sometimes it's the perception of them. You know what they've done in the past. Would it be long term? I don't know. Do we need box office? I, th- I think it's the whole package because there's a squad rebuild. You know, if you're bringing in the boys from Man City, maybe they're a better place to do a squad rebuild. You know, we've got a lot of players out of contract, a lot of four players returning to parent clubs, but I think this transfer window's going to be like like no other with the effects of COVID and, and clubs on their, on their finances. There's Barcelona struggling, there's three clubs went to close, uh, three APL clubs kind of when he lenders like close brothers and we know mm. what are clubs that go to close brothers you know French football struggling it's I think there could be a lot of bargains to be picked up for people in the know and if that's the boys from Man City so be it but you know I, I would hate to just make a, a decision on a manager under the fact that all the fans are going to accept this guy if that's the reason for making a decision or the prime consideration I think it's probably wrong 
fans' opinions need to be taken on board, but I'm not too sure how much weight. I think if that's going to most weight, it's probably wrong. I think the most weight's definitely got about what they can do long term for the club. Certainly, then a bit of it's going to be right. How is it going to be viewed by the fans? But that'll be down to Dominic Mackay to manage that and manage mm. that announcement. We could have been managed the, the Rogers announcement. It was announced at uh, a great time. We saw all the news. It was 20 odd thousand turned up to see him. So, so, so the, the announcement of him coming back was really well managed. Hopefully, uh, Mackay's, I know he's not officially in, but I'm sure he's, he's already doing some work in the background. Pulling some strings. Mm. Well, they thought you in a presser, mate. No, you're starting a rumour now. You're starting a rumour now. Um, David Kelly, I agree, Collins didn't fail at Hibs. Um, But I think what I would be basing uh, the experience of Hibs on would be perhaps, again, some of the senior pros. Um, Back then, Natasha didn't buy into his philosophy. A lot of the kind of more experienced players who have since spoken about the time that Collins had at Hibs uh, certainly don't do it in glowing terms. Do they? I mean, I remember Kevin Thompson, albeit he was a younger player back then, talking about the embarrassment of having to strip down to the waist and get get weighed in on a daily basis and all this kind of stuff. Um, so obviously his methods aren't always uh, received um, with glee, especially when there's a culture already at a club. And this is a big thing. We keep going back to the, the word culture. If there is a culture, it's difficult for a manager to come in and try and change it immediately. I mean, these things take time. And, you know, Dyla comes in, he came in alongside some of his uh, Norwegian compadres and they were trying to implement various things immediately in terms of diet uh, and, you know, the actual um, conditioning of players. And as you said, Natasha, you know, the obvious ones rebelled against it. I think Scott Brown probably rebelled against it as well. We had the um, the infamous kebab gate uh, with images that were printed of Scott Brown and then the showdown meeting with him and Brennan Rogers, which I think saved his career, saved uh, Scott mm-hmm. Brown's career. We've already spoken about the the future of Scott Brown. I'm in the camp where I think we need to keep him because we need that continuity uh, in players. Uh, you know, there's going to be a huge amount of guys leaving. We're going to have to bring in at least half a dozen, and you need to have your kind of cornerstones in the dressing room. And you need to have players like Scott Brown, Callum McGregor. I think James Forrest is in that category as well. But again, harking back to a wee discussion I had with Gary Locke yesterday, and we're talking about Craig Gordon. Um, and the last time I spoke to, to Gary, it was just before the Scottish Cup final. And I said to him, if, and, and you know, he was fairly confident, but not to the degree where he, he, he was cocky or anything like that, but he could see the deficiencies in the Celtic side. Uh, so he gave us a wee bit of insight into the um, halftime kind of discussion there in the Scottish Cup final when we're 2 nothing up. And, and it did bring that back to me, Natasha, because how many times this season have we seen a good kind of first half performance or a good start to the game I mean going ahead against the likes of AC Milan being 2 nothing up against Hearts at half time and then it dropping off so that, that raised a few questions in my mind because I don't know how often these uh, media conferences are going to take place with Celtic I, I would love it if it was weekly I think it would be brilliant every Friday but I don't know how uh, that's going to work if we did have one this week what question would you ask John Kennedy Natasha, I'm going to put you on the spot there. Because I'm that thinking I'm thinking really about the put, fitness. That has really put me on the spot, Paul. But I think you're right. I think that that is a great one. And only because you've mentioned it, it is right in my head now as well, is that I would like an explanation as to why we are in the middle of March and I've not seen the team at any point in this season look like they've achieved peak fitness. <laughs> not before Christmas, not after Christmas, you know, not at the start of the season not as we're getting towards the end of the season I've never seen a team put out that looks fully fit and why is that you know why haven't they been able to get this squad to full fitness um, throughout the entirety of the season we concede far too many goals in the last 20 minutes and that is something you never thought you'd say about a Celtic team is because you know we used to watch Celtic over the last you know, before this season, you know, the last few years before that. And even where the game was tight and we were getting, you know, the other team were sitting really deep and they were hard pressing us, you'd always think, oh, they'll tire. You know, they won't be able to keep this up for 90 minutes. The chances will come. Just keep working away and keep playing the quick passing football. This team will tire. The press will drop. They'll drop and we'll get the goal. 
the absolute reverse has happened this mm. season. Um, you know, even if we want to look at the the game against Aberdeen, you know, two weeks ago, the game against Dundee United just there, in both of those games, I actually saw improvement in the first half, and I know some people will debate that, but I did. I think that you know, in the first half, there was something slightly different. It was a bit sharper. The passing was quicker. The tempo was better. Obviously, nowhere near clinical enough, but there was improvements there. And then the second half comes along in both those games and the performance just drops off a cliff. So, and especially in the last 20 minutes. So why is that? Is it fitness? And why are we in March and the team are still unfit? Mm. I mean, somebody, sometimes you can see just with the physicality, the, the players, um, certain players look unfit. But I think, uh, you know, the stats are a massive part. There was something funny. I don't know if you watched the full conference on Friday last week. There was a funny question where someone asked, um, it was the boys from the Cynic, I think, asked David Turnbull about XG. You know, and um, he <laughs> did respond by saying, "What's that?" Oh, what um, that? <laughs> now, by the way, I, I, I totally take all the the stats and all the data analysis really, really seriously. I think it's a phenomenal part of the modern game. Um, but you know, I would expect the players to have embraced it by now as well. So I, I did, although it was pretty funny at the time, and he wasn't all that concerned about it. I did uh, think about it afterwards and think, you know, do you think Kieran Tierney? knows what it is, probably, down in Arsenal I'm pretty sure he knows what it is uh, so that was a wee bit of concern but I think the stats would show, I remember doing them um, a few weeks ago and the goals conceded, I think 37 or 38% of our conceded goals were on or after the 70th minute of games and that's a horrific, that is a horrific mm-hmm. stat um, so I, I'll probably revisit that and have a look at it but it just looks as though you know, the, the baseline is it looks as though we run out of puff um, the, the tempo disappears after a certain point and at that stage you're probably looking to freshen it up with good tactical changes good substitutions and that is yet another Achilles uh, heel that we've got because our, our substitutions sometimes are just uh, baffling they really are baffling I mean you've got a guy there we're making 27 chances we've got 27 attempts at goal you're thinking well if, if Lee Griffiths was involved in a percentage of them he's going to get a goal we bring him on in the last 10 minutes. I find that the whole thing that we've been moaning about all season still exists. Now, I, I know that you don't you know, click your fingers and it all changes. There's, there are some managers who have that effect. I don't think John Kennedy will ever have that effect. And I, do, I didn't expect it. But I expected to see some changes. I did expect to see some of these bad habits um, being eradicated. And I'm concerned that maybe after the new manager bounce, if that's what you can call the one nothing against Aberdeen, we've kind of flatlined again. And I'm actually looking ahead to the Glasgow Derby, and there's a lot of things to talk about in relation to that game, Lawrence. Uh, none less so than the fact that there are question marks around whether or not it's going to get played. What you've made over the last couple of days of the headlines around the behaviour of the Rangers fans having obviously been... Um, mathematically put out of sight of Celtic and winning the title. Um, I think predictable would be how I would describe it. Yeah, I think it's predictable, but I think it's probably goes back to the way that you know, I think they've been treated. You know, let's look at the last breach. Five players, one of them for the second time. Just investigate that, that yourself. Is that still yeah. going through the compliance process, Lawrence? Is that still with the SFA as we speak? But is it certainly taking a lot longer than Bolling Golly, didn't it? Mm. You know, and yeah. This is a public health issue about people breaking the bubble, perhaps contracting COVID and passing it on. Well, what's the incubation period? It's something like a few days to three weeks. Well, by the time that finishes, the, the, the public health would have been at risk. So, But just the, the fact of, you know, investigate yourself, take your own action. The government was down pretty, hitting, pretty heavily in Celtic. You look at the celebrations on Saturday... The government didn't seem, or the police didn't seem to come down heavily. So, if, if, if there's no consequence, and it just, why wouldn't people go out and celebrate? And it's, I think a fair percentage of Celtic fans would have been out celebrated. Maybe not smashing up benches and shops, but I think the level of where they went to celebration was because the government and the police and the football authorities have more or less just said, well, do what you want, investigate yourself. There's no real punishment. Well, if there's no punishment for doing it, 
What interests me, Lawrence, um, I'll throw this one over to yourself, Natasha. I've seen uh, a Twitter account. I, I've got to be honest, I, I don't know who the guy is, but he's obviously involved with the Police Federation. And I, I just felt the tone of the tweets going on around. Um, come on then, tell me what you would have done to police this situation. And I felt at that point, A, we're not in a position to tell you how to police a situation. I'm pretty sure that you have the specialist knowledge to do that yourself. But then surely the most basic way of policing something like that is uh, to do it um, in an intelligence-led um, kind of scenario, Lawrence, whereby you know it's happening, you know the certain groups that may be involved in it, and you would prepare for that accordingly. It doesn't look as though it was proactive at all, did it? Uh, Natasha just reacted to it, um, gave them free reign to do as they pleased, and the inevitable um, happened. Well, that was the problem. Um, it was it was preventable, wasn't it? Like we knew that this was going to happen, and I say that you know. Similarly, if Celtic had won something big, if Rangers had won something big, any team who's doing something of great achievement like this, there is going to be celebration. So I'm not saying that it was solely because it was Rangers fans who were getting accused of. This was, you know, predictable, regardless of which way the season was going to go. The police should have been aware that something like this did have possibility. Now, what they failed to do on Saturday was properly condemn it. Um, they failed, the media failed, and the government failed to properly condemn the scenes at Ibrox, um, out in the streets there. And by failing to do so, and by failing to take any sort of appropriate action there, that's why we saw Sunday. Mm-hmm. Like Lawrence has touched on, if there's no repercussion for the actions, it's going to happen again. So the fact that there was no repercussion or no condemnation for the Saturday resulted on the scenes we saw on the Sunday. And by then, it, you know, the, your case was lost. And there just has to have been something they were able to do to prevent that. They knew that this was happening. It was publicised widely online. Block George Square, you know, block the surrounding streets, you know, have heavy police presence there. It's not our job to tell the police how to stop a mass gathering. That's their job. Um, And they didn't do it. No, they failed miserably. Lawrence? If you look at how the police are the Black Lives Matter campaign or the anti-apartheid in Palestine campaigns, riot police, Kirtland people blocking streets around about George Square. They certainly knew how to police matters there. And why were riot police recorded, you know, required for those protests? Did they think there was a risk of riot? Is that why riot police were there, a, a risk of disorder? You would think so. So if they thought there was a risk of disorder for those, it isn't entirely unforeseeable that it would be a risk of disorder for the celebrations. So where was the similar style of policing? Why did the policing completely change? And if it is... You know, I've heard some people say, well, they knew that Black Lives Matter and uh, uh, anti-apartheid protests, there was no risk of riot. So why not have the riot police in? Because there's nothing that actually going to happen. They're not going to react. We can just control those people and move them on without any reaction. People say, well, the police were, were scared to police this in case it led to a riot. <laughs> so they will, sorry, you're scared to enforce the law in case it leads to a riot. Well, would we extend that to bank robberies if enough of us turn up? It sets, bank? It, it sets a dangerous <laughs> precedent. It certainly does. Yeah. Um, I mean, we will obviously also see Celtic's name getting dragged into it because, you know, looking at some of the press um, reaction to that story, Natasha, uh, obviously it was not just the celebrations that uh, are putting a question mark over the derby. It's also the fact that we protested last year and I noticed that was getting dragged into the scenario. So once again, you know, you've got to pull Celtic's name into something that we had absolutely no part in whatsoever. (laughs) It's frustrating, isn't it? And we got the same, you know, slightly after yesterday's show where we discussed it and we discussed the scenes we saw at the weekend. And, you know, you're obviously then flooded with comments about, oh, but what about when Celtic protested? What about the the bus chasing? We commented on that at the time. You know, we're commenting on the scenes that we saw this weekend. This is a relevant news story, not just in football, not just in Glasgow, but this is a news story across the country. And trying to use other incidents to, you know, justify or share the blame is missing the point and it's missing the point intentionally it's trying to get you know a bit of point in the other direction and oh they did it too and that's just what about today and it's absolutely pointless we're discussing something that happened this weekend and no other fans and no other group of people 
protested or celebrated this weekend. And that's what we're discussing. Um, so trying to share the blame like that is, yeah, it's pointless, really. To be honest, I, the celebrations is completely understandable with the fans. And I, I'm not saying that was the issue, celebrations. I think we, we've expected to see some celebrations in a you know, Celtic. I wonder if there would be some celebrations in Tenero. It's perhaps on the difference in policing and the difference in combination mm. the government. Mm-hmm. Are we being treated differently? Neil Lennon's alleged the government changed the rules post the bye, and instead of three players being out, it was 13. The government's response was no comment the first day, and the second comment was, it was appalling you should suggest it. Now that's like asking your mate to sleep with your, your girlfriend, and he says, that's appalling, you should ask me that. It's hardly a denial. You know, Celtic's now taking six buses to games. Aberdeen came down on one bus. Now if we look at the, the pictures on, on Saturday, you'd Stevie G arriving in a car that looked like there was three other people in. Rangers players leaving training, sharing cars. Apparently all these things have Celtic doing them or St Mirren doing them on car sharing are punishable. Well, the, the biggest issue that we'll have, Lawrence, is if uh, the club remains silent on it. If there are issues, it needs to be dealt with. And obviously there's been various things said where we are hinting, like Neil Lennon more than hinted, that there was uh, hypocrisy involved. Um, but if there are issues, it, it needs to be dealt with. And again, communicate that with the fans, because otherwise it does look as though you know there, there is no voice of the Celtic fans at that level, because um, you know the consistency or lack of it is just alarming. Uh, but again, it it brings into question whether or not the game against Rangers will take place and some of the discussions over the last few weeks were that Kennedy, John Kennedy has an opportunity to go on a winning run to stop the league campaign of Rangers being an invincible one and to perhaps even win a trophy Um, from what I've seen in the last two games Natasha, I think all of the above is fairly unlikely yeah Absolutely. Um, and if, you know, these last couple of games have been an addition, and particularly against Dundee United, I think he's failed it. Um, especially in the second half, we saw nothing different to what we have seen all season and the existing problems remain. Now in saying that, we've got two thirds of the same management team and the same squad. You know, he's not going to be able to work miracles that, were be- that weren't being worked before. So I do give him a bit of, you know, sympathy on that. He can't change things overnight. That's going to be impossible. But the the club must know and the board must know that John Kennedy can't possibly be the answer at the end of the season, regardless of what happens over the next two games and regardless of what happens in the Cup. You know, the fact remains is that John Kennedy was on that training pitch every day and on that touchline every day over the entire season. If he's got the skills required to be the man to take us forward next season, well, he certainly hasn't shown them this one. Um, and I accept that he was only number two, he wasn't the man in charge. But he was capable of doing something and he hasn't done it. And in the last couple of games, he still hasn't done it. And nothing going forward, for me, is going to show me why he should be the man for this job. That's not to say that I don't think he could be retained in some capacity. Um, I think there is perhaps a role for him at Celtic somewhere. What that will be will completely depend on who the new manager coming in is. And it will depend on John as well if he thinks that it's now time for him to move on and try something else, perhaps be a manager in his own right, um, or whether he wants to stay in some capacity at Celtic. We'll see. But I don't think he should be getting spoken about in terms of being the manager next season. No, I'd agree with that. I think um, I did expect the shackles to come off a wee bit. I expected him maybe to express himself uh, a wee bit more than he has done in terms of the personnel that he's putting out, the style of play. Uh, and some of these things that have just been almost like Groundhog Day this season with regards to us running out of steam and the substitution substitutions being absolutely bizarre have continued. Now, there's loads of other names, obviously, in the market. If you know the history, Hughes and Bowen, Mark Hughes and Mark Bowen, obviously gave a Celtic State of Mind an exclusive uh, a few weeks back. So if you've not already seen that, check it out on the YouTube channel and Larson 1967-2002 Stevie Clark doesn't want the job he has spoken in the past about not coming to manage in Glasgow um, but obviously is but just with the national team and Dayman too many folk listening to the English building up house CV I think that's a fair enough comment but I'm pretty sure um, Eddie Howe will get a job down south. I mean, we talk about the managerial merry-go-round up here. It's going to kick off down there as well as clubs start looking at relegation fights and all this kind of stuff. And I reckon Eddie Howe will get a job. And then, you know, it might be a case of us saying what might have been. Now, uh, Lawrence, we've spoken about 
the football side of it. Whoever comes in has got a huge amount of players actually not leaving the club but returning on loan deals. And I was looking at some of them. Obviously, Jack Hendry's been uh, on on the headlines because he's performed particularly well since he's gone to Belgium. Apparently, there's a two million pound option to buy. Um, should uh, Ostendi uh, decide to buy him, two million quid. We've also got Leo Hield going out to Ross County, performing well under John Hughes. He's only 17 years of age. And Cham's going to be coming back. Bio, Sved, um, Scott Robertson. Are, are we able at all? to take anything from the loanees coming back do you think there might be a nugget in there somewhere yeah potentially I mean I think you know Shred when he was at Celtic was branded the, the laziest player in training and I think it was attitude that uh, prevented him at Celtic which uh, initially had a problem on his loan spell and he, he seems to have addressed that if he comes back he was you know, doing well in Ukraine if he comes back he's a win- winger that scores goals there's an opportunity there Hendry getting rave reviews I'm sure the new manager's going to want to have a look at it uh, you, you know, Bio at second division, France we start to score goals. Uh, you know, if, if nothing else, uh, I, I think he's maybe just someone to get off the books. But I think it would be uh, whoever the new manager is has probably already watched some video of, of them on a loan spell and you know, of some players who might have said, you know, Shred, Henry, have a look at them. Robertson, I think, is one for the future. It's the same with the boy at West County, Hagel. Perhaps Bio and, and Cham, I think, times maybe come and go on. Uh, you know, Ch- Cham's one of those frustrating ones. There's definitely a player there, but never consistently. You know, he's definitely that ability. But is there any manager that's got it out of him consistently? Yeah, I, I think probably Lenny got his best response. You know, performances out of him. You know, and it's, yeah, 14 million from Porto. Jeez, oh. <laughs> Who said no to that? <laughs> well, you'll be you'll be struggling to get four million pounds for a player like in Champ, particularly if he has another bad spell, as it looks as though he is having at Marseille. What's your thoughts, Natasha? Because I mean, obviously, you, you we speak about the Celtic squad as a whole, and there are certain players. The minute you mention them, um, you know the the comments and the reaction to that is, uh, I mean, Anthony Ralston being the, the prime example, right? You mention Ralston, and everybody asks you about your sanity in relation to him playing, um, and. Henry's kind of fallen into that category. He had a, a really tough start to his Celtic career. He's gone out and got games. You know, this is a guy who in 2018 was capped by Scotland. Um, I know the scouting reports that Celtic got prior to his move were um, that he was he was one of the best players, uh, young Scottish defenders uh, in the country. Um, could it just be a case of going away and getting your confidence and he might come back as a better option than uh, what he was when he left? Absolutely, and he is someone that I would like to see another look at. Um, you know, by all accounts, he's doing very well in his loan spell. Um, and by the recent interview he did on on Sky Sports, he said he did seem to suggest that he hadn't been given a fair enough chance at Celtic, um, and mm. that he might have benefited from more time. And it must be endlessly frustrating for him. So yes, he did make mistakes when he came in. Um, he didn't get off to a great start at Celtic. He didn't look like a great player, and the fans were all on his back. And he was, you know, dropped pretty quickly and then out on loan pretty quickly how frustrating must it be for him to then see Celtic bring in another loan player at the cost that it's costing to perform probably worse than Henry performed during his time here and because we've no other option really he continues to get a game Um, so I can imagine why that's frustrating for Henry so yeah bring him back in let's have another look at him it is an area we're short on and if you've got a player you know there who's doing well in the Belgian league Let's take a look. Let's see if there is anything there that's that's worth holding on to. Um, I don't know what the options are in terms of his loan agreement, where there's an option to buy, who gets the final say on that. Um, it'll be interesting to see. But for me, especially in an area like centre-half, where we're particularly low on, or we probably will be low on by the time the transfer window comes around, um, I don't see why we wouldn't take another look at Jack Henry. No, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think the concern will be that next season we're going to start off with Bain, Ralston, Taylor, Hendry and Welsh. That will be the back five. Um, now, there is a comment coming in from David Kelly. We are discussing the hypocrisy within Scottish football, government and police force. I think David is, is explaining that um, in order to obviously speak about the wider issues that Celtic are involved in from time to time, you need to obviously 
mm. speak about the the behaviour of Rangers and the treatment, or otherwise of uh, Rangers. So, no, it is a Celtic yeah. state of mind, but obviously it does involve Celtic ourselves. Now, there is another um, big issue that I think we need to cover. We had Celtic shared on. Um, as organised by yourself recently. Natasha, I thought it was a very worthwhile discussion we had that day to try and put their message out to a wider audience. And there has been an interesting development over the last few days in relation to the Celtic Trust, who obviously support Celtic Shared. And they're suggesting that when it comes down to um, getting a refund for this season, that fans should be offered the option of shares instead. So they're proposing a new share issue whereby the funds are held within the club, so it benefits the club going into the unknown next season, but it also means that um, the the fans are going to get something in terms of eventually some form of control uh, of the club, or not, not control of the club, but a say in the way the club is run. Absolutely, um, and it's a great idea. Realistically, what Celtic have asked 57,000 season ticket holders to do this season is make a 600, 700, 800 pound donation to the club. And in return, we've got the equivalent of a 90 pound a season TV subscription. Now, the clubs don't know the financial positions of the fans, but I'm going to stagger a guess that not everyone will be in a position to make a £600 donation to Celtic Football Club without anything in return. Um, So there has to be something in return. Um, We're not saying that everybody should keep the money in the club and take shares um, by way of that return, but it should certainly be an option available to the fans. The club could see it as beneficial as having keeping that money in some way, but also recognising that they can't simply hold on to this fans' money as as a donation. And you're right, the one thing that the Celtic that Celtic Shared and the Celtic Trust have in common and the sort of key objective of both is for fans to have a better say in the running of the club. Um, a bit more representation and for our voices to be listened to. And one of the ways in doing that is the shared issue. Um, and yeah, like you said, we're not trying to control the club at this stage. You know, having you know a few a few shares of this value is certainly not going to rival um, anyone at Desmond's level of share value. But it's a start, and it's a way of the fans having that bit of representation that they're looking for. I think when I've seen it, um, obviously the Celtic Trust have had plans in place for some time and obviously they've been very open. And in actual fact, David Lowe's appeared quite a few times on a Celtic State of Mind to talk about their intentions. But they've seen an opportunity where it would work for their objective, of course it would, but it's another way that the money stays with the club. And that, that's a big thing that when I seen it, I thought, you know, as long as the money stays with the club, we're not going to cripple the club, Lawrence, by £25 million in refunds is getting shelled back out to, uh, to fans' bank accounts. That, that would make even um, Jungle Lions worry next season that if Welsh and Henry are Celtic centre-half next season, good luck. It could happen if there's a £25 million black hole in the accounts. Yeah, I mean, they could take it further, you know, because I, I think it's a brilliant idea. But, you know, going forward and seasons going forward, why don't you have the op- option when you purchase a season book to increase that fee by 10, 20%, whatever, or £100 and have like, a money share issue every year? It, it would certainly work for the fans. Feel like you're getting something more for your money. Give the, the club, you know, raise the income for them. And it, I, I think it's something that, that the club should be definitely looking at. You know, we've heard some noises that, you know, Certainly, you know, Desmond, since he's held 34% of the shares, it's been a successful period, perhaps not this year, but that the club's for sale to anyone with Celtic with the best interests at heart. So I don't think, if that's right, you'd have any objections to, you know, fans increasing their, their shareholding. And, you know, season tickets have given, been given that opportunity, I think, would be a great way to do it. You know. mm-hmm. And you could perhaps uh, widen it to the Celtic diaspora in, in general every season. Because I, I know, I speak to a friend who, who lives in France now, Michael Doyle, and he's frustrated at you know, how much involvement he can have at a distance. If there was something that he could do, yeah, you know, purchase and sales every year or some kind of membership package, he would love to do that. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. as good as we are at monetising them, uh, that the support of Celtic are at monetising the sport, we don't seem to be able to do it uh, in a way that really gives value back. You know, We can all get the let's gear, Adidas tops, whatever. So those commercial arrangements are good, but actually a say in the club or something more belonging to it, it doesn't seem to come across, you know. 
I think Fergus's vision was it would never again be controlled by one man. Mm. And I think when he showed the shares, that that was certainly true. And then we needed more money, and the share issue wasn't taken up. So Desmond had to step in, and you know, and, and thank goodness he did step in and, and fulfil that void. But you know, if there's a you know, feel within the fans, that Celtic share that that can kind of harness that to take it back closer to Ferguson's vision, I think it would be better. Well, perhaps we'll get the Celtic Trust back on. Natasha, we could maybe organise that and have a wee chat with them, see what their their view is and what the plans are in relation to that. Now, um, Stephen Kelly, who is commenting on YouTube, says Bio should get a chance. The reason I'm bringing this up is um, the defensive lineup that I said there, actually, in all probability, before we bring any new players in, will be the players that we have available, the players that we have at our disposal. You know, we've only got one right back on our books if, if Kenny goes back to Everton. We've only got one left back on our books when Luxalt goes back to AC Milan. It is likely that Ayer is going to leave the club. Um, I'd rather he stayed. I've said that before. All the, all the kind of top three, four players that might leave, I'd much rather Ayer stays. I think we need his leadership qualities. We need a centre half. Um, because if he was to go and Julian's out to October, what centre halves do we, do we have? I mean, Beaton's going to be leaving as well. That's been made pretty clear, and he's been out the squad for several weeks. So you've got Welsh. You've got, you've got Welsh and you've got Julian coming back in from injury. So, you know, it is a, a situation where if, if Griffiths leaves because he's entered in the last year's contract, you know, if Edward leaves, which looks likely, if uh, a Yeti goes back to Switzerland or elsewhere because it's not worked out, you are left with Bayo and Clamalo up front. And that's where we are. And that's the, the whole, you know, that's the magnitude of the, the, the rebuild that we face this summer. And that's why we need to make these moves quicker than we're currently making them. Because if you bring someone in to assess the squad, by which time you, you turn around and 10 of the players are gone, then, you know, it's going to take months for you to then start getting your own players in. Um, and we don't have months. I think it was only 100 days or so when Tony was talking on Friday there before we play um, the Champions League qualifier. 100 days to come in, assess your squad, decide on where we need to strengthen, um, try and implement your own philosophy and the players that are already there. I, I mean, the, the scale of this rebuild is absolutely huge. And I keep going back to that season just after Barnes and Dalglish. Uh, and the only way that it worked is because we brought someone in of the stature of Martin O'Neill, who at that point was in his managerial pomp. He was never better than when Celtic actually appointed him as a manager. Um, not that long before that, the Leeds United, who back then were a different beast than what they are now, they, they were serious about getting Martin O'Neill in as a manager. I mean, they had designs on the Champions League back then. You know, David O'Leary into the Champions League semi-final. Was it the semi-finals, Lawrence? You know, it's Correct me if I'm wrong. Sounds yep. absurd, but you know, they had a superb run in the Champions League. And we got O'Neill in at that stage of his career where, you know, the natural kind of progression for him would have probably been the Man United job after he left Celtic with his connections with Devin Desmond. That's the scale of the, the rebuild we have. And I still think that although um, I, I've been impressed with some of the names and Maresca, uh, I quite like the idea of that, it's something we need to get in and we need to implement it immediately because that, that squad is going to be depleted uh, and it's already low in confidence and you know, I just think it's, yeah, it's going to be tough to sell season tickets this time round, what about this time next season if we don't win the league for a second time then we really do have an issue on our hands you know, so that's my, th my thought on it, um, but I hope that the decision makers already have something in place now, Natasha, we need to get the Celtic Trust back on so we can talk to them about their ideas around uh, the share issues, uh, and some time ago we also spoke to the Billy McNeil um, you know, the tribute guys who were raising funds for the statue the commemorative statue and I think we need to get them back on soon as well because there's been developments there um, but yeah it's always been a pleasure I'm on the bulletin now twice a week you've already been on it twice a week Natasha you were on yesterday I'll be back on Thursday and tomorrow um, it will be Colin Watt and Amy Canavan all that's left for me to say is if you're on YouTube make sure to subscribe to the channel we are producing content on a daily basis um, and all that I've got to say now is Lawrence Conley uh, apologies for the issues with your sound early doors but thank you for joining me and once again Natasha thanks for joining me on a Celtic State of Mind <laughs>